panel chair for this session. I'm very pleased to welcome Simeon Rahim to moderate the discussion. So our panel chair. So our panel chair for this session, I'm very pleased to welcome Simeon Ehui. He's just adjusting his chair here. Um, Simeon is with the World Banks uh, in their agriculture, and uh, he's the agriculture and practice manager for South Asia, especially focusing on technical and managerial leadership for agriculture, irrigation, and natural resources in South Asia, on leading a shift to a middle-income country focus and on supporting the introduction of innovative lending and knowledge products. Simeon's been with the World Bank since 2003 and before then, he's actually an ILRI alumni, uh, he was an agricultural economist and program manager at ILRI and before then with one of ILRI's sister CG centers, the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. Simeon. Welcome home, please. Thank you very much, Shelby, and uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, truly happy to be here uh, to chair this particular uh, session on uh, uh, the economic well-being, okay, of uh, uh, for livestock keepers. Um, coming back here after uh, leaving the institution early 12 years is really re refreshing because um, I haven't not been able to really come back and, and be associated with the institution uh, since I left in 2003. Um, I'm an agricultural economist by training, but uh, what's comforting is that uh, in the World Bank, uh, I'm regarded by many as a livestock expert so in the region where I work, regardless of what comes up, whether it is uh, genomics or biotechnology, they come to me. So I take pride of having passed through the ILRI process for 13 years of my life. Now, this morning, uh, we had actually, uh, the, sta the stage was set uh, with the global trends uh, in terms of uh, what's happening in the world. Uh, we learned that... Um, the population in 40 years from now will grow from the current 7 billion to uh, 9 billion. It's a huge number. And that the uh, middle class will grow from 50% to 70%, uh, mostly from developing countries. And all these people will demand livestock products. And it's expected that um, Livestock, including uh, poultry <coughs> and fish, will double livestock demand by 2050, 54, by 70%, okay, which is quite a huge number. Specific numbers that I was able to get from my own research, poultry and egg will demand will increase by 63%, milk by 55%, ruminant meat by 44%. Those trends in demand will require a total transformation of about how we do business, as it was said today. And how uh, the small other farmers that we are working with are going to adapt and meet the challenges of this demand. How can we ensure that they are not left on the side, that they participate in this transformation that we are you know, ex ex expecting? It will happen because it's demand driven. We have no choice, it will happen. It's going to happen. The question now is, you know, what are we doing to be able to, to really help those small order farmers to, to participate in this transformation that's gonna take place? And that's the challenge that's being posed by, to us, uh, whether we are uh, in government, whether we are in research, whether we are in developing, uh, developing um, I mean, a lending agency or not. So we have uh, four dis distinguished um, panelists that um, I'd like to um, introduce. We have um, with us His Excellency uh, Atto Wondirat, who is the currently uh, State uh, Minister of Agriculture in Ethiopia. 
before that, he was a researcher and extension director in the government. The other panelist is, um, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce very well, it must be, a, I don't know if it's a Dutch name, but uh, Jorgen, you're, you're, you're you're almost, <laughs> but he's the, the global dairy uh, coordinator at um, SNV, and SNV I think is um, the Netherlands Development Organization. The, the third uh, panelist is uh, Tom Randolph. Tom Randolph is currently director of the CGI, CGI research program on livestock and fish, and he has been in Illyri uh, for a few years now. The fourth speaker is uh, Madame Susan Mina, Minai, and she is officer in charge, FAO, sub regional office for Eastern Africa, and interim representative to the African Union, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa and Ethiopia. Uh, to follow the trend of uh, my predecessor, uh, uh, Joyce, I would like to uh, plan by asking a specific question to the panelists, basically. Uh, they will be specific in the sense that uh, because each panelist basically represents a, um, a particular trade area, business area. It's uh, important to try to see how we can, uh, um, I mean, sort of uh, put in shape the, the question. Now, the issues that uh, we project ourselves 40 years from now, uh, we know that things are going to happen. There will be some change, transformation. Between now and then, uh, what are the sort of changes that's gonna, that we're going to do to make sure that those smaller farmers in our countries actually participate in the transformation? So I would like to start uh, with uh, the Honorable Minister, who is every day dealing with um, policy and institutional issues, strategy, development. Uh, Honorable Minister, what are, if you think 50 years, 40 years from now, and given what you are doing daily in your government, what are the sort of changes in policy and institution that you think uh, you can do to make sure that the farmers in Ethiopia can participate effectively in the transformation that we envisage uh, 40 years from now, building on your experience. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Simon, for uh, giving me the first uh, question to be addressed because uh, it is an opportunity to really go open without uh, considering that what will the, my colleagues will say. I will build upon my, my colleague earlier, uh, particularly on uh, what the significance of agriculture is, and particularly of livestock, and the existing resource that we have. Uh, I try to go through a very simple uh, dictionary, what well-being is. As we know, the simplest I get is a state of health, happiness, and or prosperity. And therefore, it is, I, I consider that it's a state of prosperity. Then it is creating wealth to the smallholder farmer. So everything goes about wealth and additional income. And therefore, when we look at the current situation, that smallholder farmers are the most vulnerable part of society, as we heard, as we heard earlier as well, they are ignored, but at the same time they have the huge opportunity because currently they are contributing more than, in Ethiopian case, more than 90% of agricultural output comes from smallholder farmers. While the country is making progress in agriculture, which drives the overall economy for the last decade, reaching a double digit economic growth. Basically, it's coming from agriculture. So it actually shows that agriculture has an opportunity. So when it comes to individual smallholder farmers, they cannot make their choice even if they want because of a number of barriers that it has already been discussed. Therefore, the number one is to really understand the circumstances that we are in, that we have the resource we have is smallholder farmers themselves, their labor, their already whatever assets they have is their existing assets. 
and at the same time they have labor in the natural resource base. Therefore, the entry point where we actually took, in the case of Ethiopia, is particularly to rehabilitate the degraded land and maintain the existing natural resource we have so that it will be sustainable in one aspect. And on the other hand, we were highly vulnerable to the food insecurity uh, situation just because of the degradation of natural resource. Therefore, this we have done a significant move as we have heard also from our Deputy Prime Minister this morning, we have made significant progress in terms of curbing degradation and deforestation from which has been 3% to now 11%. So this change, what is an opportunity that it created? It creates. In the food insecurity areas, the entry point particularly from experience showed us that it's not further uh, relying on cropland, particularly in marginal areas. We have been cropping those areas, and therefore the opportunity is while maintaining uh, to rehabilitate and to maintain those natural resource managed land, but they can create huge opportunities for livestock intervention. Number one is apiculture. Then without destructive means, then it really creates an opportunity and tremendously lifting people out of poverty. The other issue is through the protection of uh, environment, and then rehabilitation of additional land, which used to be very barren and highly degraded mountainous and hill areas, now being a source of uh, feed and a source of additional grass. Therefore, this is giving us an opportunity in those areas for rural youth employment, particularly for youth and also women as a new uh, income. Therefore, these are reclaiming the degraded, once degraded and abandoned area into creating wells for smallholder farmers. The other opportunity my colleague earlier mentioned on the particularly the three systems of livestock, the peri urban, the pastoral, and the mixed cropping, then the interventions has been already highlighted, and then it needs an investment. Why do we invest in government? As we said, we have farmers have a lot of challenge. In terms of institutional, there are challenges. In terms of service provision, there is a challenge, and particularly access to market and then capacity building. Therefore, this, the front line would be then to strengthen these extension services, and particularly to pay the, the largest or the highest extension worker per capita in the world at this moment, followed by China and, and India. This is just a commitment. This is actually the result and the core reason why agriculture is making progress, but at the same time, livestock is being challenged because of the, 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 the gestation period that it needs, and the investment rate of investment is not as quick as that of crops because the investment rate of return can be uh, easily observed within one year of intervention. Therefore, institutional capability and particularly the scaling up of best practices strategies that we have been following and earlier discussed on capacity building, service provision, including the animal health and even agricultural input, which still is a challenge and therefore that's a number of modalities and new innovative approaches have been taken, particularly linking the private and the public-private partnership even currently that we are starting and the number of uh, other interventions. One, one example I, I know uh, is when, when we started the uh, synchronized breeding in Ethiopia, many people particularly were skeptical that you cannot fail. Although the pilot, as uh, my, my colleague Dr. Gabriel Xavier earlier mentioned that it was a pilot, but when it is scaled up, then you cannot sustain it. So we made, we request the CTA to conduct an assessment in country and particularly going through what is the success and how are we going to really sustain this given the institutional and the smallholder farmer fragment system. Because it was believed to be in a commercial, but not been successfully implemented in highly scattered and smallholder based uh, system then the, the outcome was very, very encouraging. They were very much excited, and I was fortunate enough to meet them after they completed. So it is, everything is possible. It's possible given that the mindset of farmers is changed, provided that the input service is highly linked, and also market, then which we need to invest a lot, and as has been already uh, highlighted. So when you look into 40 years ahead of time, ahead of us, then as rightly put, we need to invest at, at this moment than investment in infrastructure. Investment, because an investment will have its own return, and at the same time, it needs to be adopted into the local situation 
while our farmers, what we have, the experience we have is once they are supported, once they are really, the constraints are understood, and there is a committed government and product support system is established, they are the most receptive to technologies and because they want to change their lives. They want to prosper and then this, it is possible. So we need to really create this uh, uh, system to really have a committed support, a commitment and sustained support which will be driven by knowledge and experience and hunting and looking for the best practices also elsewhere. Because it's, it's really a challenging going from one commodity to commodity. The infrastructure and the local situation is very, very diverse, particularly in a country like Ethiopia. The agroecological diversity, infrastructure challenge because of the topography. It has its own tolls, but it is possible that we are making significant progress. Th th thank you very much, uh, Honorable, Honorable Minister, for uh, uh, giving us um, your perspective on what is what you envisage, what you think that needs to be done, especially uh, investment in public goods that you mentioned, um, rehabilitation of lands, and um, support of extension, infrastructure development, capacity building, and so on, exactly what the different countries have to do. I would like to um, move from the country level to more regional level uh, to uh, development agencies, um, especially uh, the FAO. I'd like to ask um, Madam Susan Mine, um, given what we expect in the next uh, 40 years, uh, how can you give us your perspective about how you see an institution like FAO and similar type of institutions supporting basically uh, this transformation? What are the sort of changes do you think that um, an institution like FAO can put in place to ensure that uh, that the farmers participate effectively in the transformation that uh, <coughs> we anticipate in the next 40 years. Thank you and congratulations to Ibi. I am looking for this child who has, uh, is now 40 years. I'm still looking, maybe by the time we are at the panel, I will have discovered who this child is. In, uh, when, when the issue was raised to the, the previous panel, I was thinking that um, the best thing that could happen in 40 years is that uh, IRI will be 80 years. Actually, FEO will already be 100. So we would all have died uh, of old age. <laughs> and gracefully too, having accomplished and provided all the support and made ourselves irrelevant because the systems will be so efficient and we would have very efficient value chains. So this is my, um, this is my thinking of what really needs to happen. And for this to really happen in a graceful way, the, um, the, the most uh, probably critical thing is to strengthen the institutions that support small scale farmers, and I think in this case, other value chain actors. From, uh, and, and I'm talking of traders, those people who are involved in value addition, and those who provide other services like credit and, and so on. So in my thinking, from a regional perspective, as was mentioned earlier, one of the, the critical things is to uh, strengthen the, um, these regional e economic groupings because they are the ones who work directly with the, with the countries and the communities so that they can, um, they can enhance the capacities, uh, at especially at the community level. But I think more importantly, also to facilitate uh, best uh, learning and best practices exchange between the countries. So regional integration, regional ex exchange, and uh, networking amongst uh, members is important. When you think of uh, an organization like IRI, and uh, the, 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 the previous panelists have mentioned 
the benefit they have gained by being, um, having participated in programs or training or different thing, uh, activities of, of IRI, you will know that IRI has made a map in terms of livestock development. If, when you arrive at the airport here in Addis, and you, you say that I'm going to FAO, they look at you and they wonder, who is FAO? And you tell them, FAO. They look at you again and they don't know what is FAO. But if you tell them you are going to any campus, the taxi drivers know where to go. <laughs> so th this is the kind of impact and mapping that you really want from, uh, from an organization. And so I think that um, being able to train, to support uh, the, the countries, to exchange knowledge is, is crucial. I think that um, the change or the thinking which has happened from thinking of livestock as one of those things you do at the back of your garden, to put it on the map, to show how it contributes to economic growth. This is the kind of contribution an organization like FAO uh, can, can make. And to bring to the table some of the strategic thinking that is crucial to push the, um, the industry to the, the next level. I think that um, if you had called this meeting five years ago, the State Minister of Livestock would have had difficulties talking about private sector. He's now very comfortable as talking about integrating the private sector because the thinking of what is the role of the private sector has changed. Uh, likewise, I, I think now our issues on gender is not whether women or the youth are important. It is developing the strategies to integrate them, to institutionalize their contribu contribution in a more significant manner. And then to bring to the table some of the other important issues like food safety, uh, value addition, improved marketing, so that we can uh, integrate and improve the nutrition of, of our communities. So I think to end up, I, I think that 40 years from now, we will all, all of us sitting here, will have become redundant because uh, we would have put the proper strategic uh, policies in place, all the enabling, environ uh, enabling environment will be in place, all the capacity building and institution uh, strengthening will have happened. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Vandamine. Um, I think um, this is really um, a statement with a lot of um, optimism, and I hope it becomes a really a reality that, that will become redundant. In this context of redundancy, I'd like to ask uh, Tom, what sort of research do you think an institution like ILIRI and similar type of institution can get involved in to get the small farmers to be prepared for 20, 2054 and make Illiri redundant. Okay, I, I, I sort of disagree that, that we're <laughs> going to be redundant because we always reinvent ourselves because the problems are, are evolving. I think if we had had this conversation 40 years ago, um, the discussion would have been about subsistence farmers. They're, they don't exist anymore. Today we're talking about how do we link farmers into markets and what are those opportunities. Okay. 40 years from now, what will we be talking about? I think it will be how do we protect those small business, farm businesses, and all the associated food, agribusiness um, in the value chains, how do we keep growing that and how do we keep it inclusive? And that will be our niche. We'll be continuing to provide that public research that helps to develop private, more private sector type farming as small businesses. 
and the associated agri-food industry. Um, so I think we'll create new challenges um, <laughs> uh, as, as we go along. So inclusiveness is going to be continuing to be, I think, our, our key role and the filter of what type of research we do. How do we make and continue to produce the type of research, the type of technologies and strategies that the ministry can continue to offer to these nascent and beginning to grow small businesses? And we know that there'll be a transition, and the, the prediction is that out of the rural population now, a farming population, one third of the population will fall out of agriculture and go to the city. One third will specialize and become professional farmers. And, and there's one third that's sitting on the fence, depending on whether there are opportunities for them. And our goal right now with the Honorable Minister is to create those kind of opportunities that that allow people to use agriculture as a way of transitioning into other, other professions, um, other livelihoods. Uh, and that's going to be our role, is can we provide the kinds of technologies that are inclusive that allow those kind of opportunities for our target population. Um, and what is going to be different about the way we operate and the challenge for our research is that it won't be us alone It'll be more and more that we have to be working with our partners, especially in the private sector, in the NGO sector, who understand better what those problems are and what the opportunities are going to be for our research to, to connect in. We have to become more demand-driven. It used to be we were demand-driven because we had to align with regional priorities, the research priorities of a country. I think we're going to have to become more demand-driven in real time in working with our partners in the private sector who are understanding the quickly uh, evolving context <coughs> and opportunities in helping smallholder businesses to, to be able to react and respond to that and, and creating the capacity for that. Um, and for us, that, that means that we just aren't going to be working on technologies that are a solution silver bullet, one size fits all, it's a vaccine. It's going to have to be now much more nuanced type of research tailored to different contexts uh, and different kinds of, of clientele in terms of this continuum from the subsistence farmer to the small farmer businessman and businesswoman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for giving um, a, a different view from uh, <laughs> Madame Mine, and... Um, I was reinforcing. <laughs> okay, reinforcing her views about what's gonna happen. I would like to um, go to, um, I'll try again, Doctor. okay, at this time, Dreyer, is that correct? Almost. Almost. <laughs> okay, well, by the time we finish, I'll try to, I'll, I'll, I'll practice. But anyway, I, um, you are coming in from perspective, perspective of the um, NGO and also the, the private sector. Um, definitely, the role of private, private sector cannot be uh, overemphasized. It will be very important in the next um, uh, 40 years. Uh, but it's not automatic. Okay, it's not automatic. Uh, how do you think, uh, what do you think can be done to, to really ensure a smooth transition in, in a way that the private sector can play an effective role to ensure this transformation, this movement, okay, from, let's say, you know, the, the rural area to the urban areas and, and the private sector coming in in the agribusiness area. What do you think can be done to really ensure that? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jurjen Dreyer, but uh, I had a few years <laughs> of practice uh, before you, so. Um, first of all, happy birthday, uh, Ilri. Um, we, um, we are a little bit older and we hope we can invite you to our 50th uh, birthday, or, or I should say birth year maybe, uh, next year. I am um, going to try to answer your question from an NGO perspective. Um, and although I have a background in both pastoralism and dairy, because I'm sort of living and breathing dairy these days, I'll, I'll have very much have a dairy background to my answer. 
Um, we believe at SFV, the Netherlands Development Organization, we are an NGO, and we believe research is extremely important, and we want to make sure that the research findings and the innovations are getting down to farm level. Um, and in order to do that, we started uh, beginning of this year a strategic partnership with ILRI. We signed an MOU. Uh, we have uh, almost weekly uh, uh, talks with SMV how we can collaborate. So, so far, that's proving to be very um, efficient and successful. Um, in SMV, we very much have a private sector approach. Uh, at the same time, we have a small scale, um, a smallholder approach. Um, and we believe that in order for the private sector to uh, have the economies of scale and to be interested in investing in some of the, let's say, more remote areas, um, we need to work with both the smallholders and the maybe the medium and the larger scale farmers. And we are looking for business models that uh, they can actually collaborate um, so that uh, private sector starts to invest where both the smallholders and the larger farmers can, can benefit. And we are already seeing some very interesting results in some of our key dairy uh, areas. Um, maybe the future, I mean, the, 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 um, the links between the smallholders and, and the medium scale farmers, uh, Tom already started saying a little bit, perhaps we don't have that many smallholder farmers in, in the next 40 years, but um, we want to focus on those smallholders that see dairy as a business and are ready to invest in, in their dairy um, management uh, and help them to scale up their approach and, and, and uh, get more money from their dairy. Um, as we all know, the, the demand is going up um, for milk products. We discussed that this morning. Um, we do see also a lot of uh, private sector interest actually and specifically in, uh, in East Africa. Uh, so in order to support that development and to also to try to increase milk production for the, for the demand that is out there and still growing, we have developed uh, three, what we call the or three solutions. Um, so maybe if I go through them, we can, I'll quickly look at the research questions connected to those, um, where we think that maybe in the future we might want to do more research. Um, so what we want to, what we envision um, as SMV is uh, smart farmers that produce safe milk from green cows. So those are the three uh, solutions. Smart farmers has everything to do with training and skills, practical skills specifically. It has everything to do with uh, IT innovation and, and, and getting the research findings to those farmers. But also looking um, for sustainable business models to deliver support services uh, to those farmers. Because uh, as a dairy farmer, there's many, many support services you need in terms of finance, advice, mechanization perhaps, uh, artificial insemination, breeding, et cetera, et cetera. There's many inputs and, and services that are needed. Then if I look at our safe milk approach, um, food safety uh, is already an issue. It will only become in the next 40 years a bigger issue, I think. Um, we are looking for solutions for um, perhaps aflatoxin. Um, we have many smallholder farmers who produce small quantities of milk. Therefore, milk testing is uh, quite expensive. We are looking for solutions to perhaps measure bacteria in, in two liters of milk and, so that, and cheap and quick so that it's still uh, uh, feasible to test all the different milk uh, from all the different farmers. Uh, zoonotic diseases uh, obviously is another problem that we, we talked about already this morning as well. Uh, then within our green cow solution, we see a clear collaboration with, with ILRI in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, in terms of uh, biogas, using the slurry for fodder production to keep the nutrient cycles closed. Henning talked about that this morning. Renewable energy, innovations in the renewable energy, the dairy sector is using a lot of energy. How can we try to reduce the energy and the water use? Uh, but of course, in general, um, and Henning said that very, very, very nicely, we have to uh, increase the efficiency of the production 
with less cows, we should produce more milk and then emissions will go down. So to make a production system more efficient, you have to think about support services, skills, training, uh, support services, breeding, etc., etc. So that is my. Thank you very much. I think we, we, we have had um, four but complementary, different but complementary uh, interventions uh, from the public sector, government, from the regional type of organizations, from research, from the private sector, NGO, um, and I can see a lot of connection between them. Uh, to be able to uh, move forward, in, uh, what I would like to, to do is to actually um, bring forward here the questions uh, from the floor. I've got uh, a few here, and they're actually you know, uh, quite relevant to uh, your statements. So one question more coming is for uh, your, your, Jorgen, Jorgen, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry I had to learn how to pronounce it. Okay, um, so the, f the question is, the follow is, is as follows. The floor is open for private sector, okay? Uh, but how do you ensure public uh, private partnership arrangement? How do you ensure that the, the public private partnership arrangement are pro poor? Do, do you have, can you give two examples of local level PPPs that have been designed? And even though I'm, I'm um, targeting your question to you, I think you know, you, all, any, any of us can try to answer that if you have examples like that. But given what you are doing in linking, you know, the private, uh, I mean, the small order farmers to, to the market and to the other businesses, you might have some, you know, preliminary answers on, on that for you. Uh, yes, we have, we have quite a, a few already quite successful PPPs, public-private partnerships going on. Um, Often for private sector, there's a risk in, in investing in a, in a country like Ethiopia or Kenya or Rwanda. And I think our approach there is that we can, together with the private sector, we can access public funds that will take away some of that risk, uh, where the private sector can establish the business at the same time as a development partner will ensure the inclusiveness of, of the smallholders. Um, I think... Uh, I think that is my answer. Okay. And, and, and yeah, please, if you have example, come, I think it's an important question. Yeah. Uh, I think the most important uh, aspect within the partnership is creating a win-win situation. If we are, be because we want this partnership to be sustainable, and therefore that's the reason why public investment has to come. But is it, the intention is to actually drive smaller the farmers out of poverty and to prosper them or to create an opportunity for the private sector? I think this is the, the, the key question that we have to come from. So the intention for us is to actually create an enabling environment for all actors, but driven so that to pull millions of smaller the farmers out of poverty <coughs> and so that they will prosper. But in doing so, then we create lots of opportunity for value addition, for for a private sector to come in, and at that time, then the risk of the private sector will be very minimal. So by itself, the environment will really be able to attract the private sector. Otherwise, no private sector will come. Whatever incentive we provide, whatever enabling environment we, we put, unless or otherwise there is real, uh, very, very low risk that it cannot come. So I think this is a very uh, critical element and how we look, at, we look at it. Then when this is done, uh, then, then it can attract. The other al alternative we have to look is, uh, my colleague earlier said that smaller uh, farmers are biz private business entities. The issue is the mentality of subsistence and the mentality of commercial, uh, being you know, as a commercial entity. It's not a matter of size. The size is just a matter of development, so I think we, we consider them. So the opportunity is to have cooperatives and farmer organizations. When they pool their own resources, then they can really create an opportunity. We are having a very good example in terms of creating a very viable and vibrant 
cooperatives and unions to go into the industry. So those actually come from their own, and then this is also private sector. They operate with the, with the principle of private sector. They, uh, they are commercial entities. So this way, I think this is one of the big opportunities that we have not yet maximized as a way of uh, going through uh, in this regard. Yep. If you don't mind, you actually see, uh, can you take the mic again? Uh, the next question is uh, for you. Um, uh, please indicate um, institutional and policy needs for facilitating expansion of strategies of small commercial farmers in rural areas. Uh, I, the issue is we know that smallholder farmers are highly fragmented in terms of uh, even geographical set, uh, settlement, the way they live, and also the resource base is very small. Uh, if it is land holding, then probably one hectare of an average land holding is very minimum, very small. And in terms of live animals, then very small. So that actually makes them to really create uh, economic scale so that they can benefit. So that, uh, the issue of institutional arrangement and providing of basic services for capacity building in terms of extension service and also where, where there is no viable private sector in terms of provision of veterinary services, also public has to invest in terms of the, the, the prevention and at the same time uh, the, the, the treatment. Therefore, so that we can really build their capacity. So economic scale, resilience, and then household uh, capacity to actually accommodate, and then uh, to create resources for more investment can come. So at that time, then they w once they have confidence, then adoption of technologies, adoption of new methods, and investment in the new uh, the technologies, it could be AI, improved breeds, and all will come once we create a service. Otherwise, particularly farmer, investing in, in improved uh, uh, heifer, the risk of losing that cow will be, will be unimaginable. Mm. It will be very devastating. So we need to make sure that this, in order to provide them the necessary package to protect those that uh, asset and livelihood so that it will be sustainable. Once we ensure immediately the next year that they will double it, and then within five years, I think it will be small scale enterprises. So to pull people out of these situations, then institutional arrangement, institutional investment, and capacity building has to come in. So it, it, it is a prerequisite for really taking out of subsistence farming towards commercialization. Thank you. Um, I would like to, the next question is for Tom. If, and, and again, it can go to uh, anyone else um, because they are brought it up. Uh, small order farmers, small orders, agricultures is in crop livestock system will remain an important farming system for the next decades. How does Illyri envision its role in research for development in this increasingly challenging environment? In, in which ecosystem? In which environment? <laughs> in, in this increasing, increasingly challenging environment. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean. There, there are two things. There, there's going to be, in this environment, there's going to be uh, issues in terms of how do we protect the farmers and these growing businesses, both in terms of ensuring that they remain competitive. And that's going to be the real, the, the real challenge. Um, right now, we're just trying to get the basic constraints sorted out, and then now helping them to, to remain competitive. The other issue is protecting them in terms of the externalities which Honorable Mis Minister um, mentioned, how do we, that's the role of public research again, how do we protect them in terms of providing them the tools of, for uh, food safety so that they aren't pushed out of the market because of uh, lower quality uh, products? How do we protect them because they're seen as, as damaging the environment? How do we already provide them with the types of strategies to improve their, their um, stewardship of the of their resources. Thank, thank you, Tom. Um, one last question before we, we close. I will. Um, it's for everybody, but I would like to start with Madame Mine. Uh, there are today's. Wh where are today's youth in your grand plans for livestock farming? 
uh, youth of today are told to go to school, to get good uh, jobs, why not uh, become self-employed farmers? I think it's an important question that can also be relevant for uh, the minister also, the youth. Yes, uh, the, uh, the current uh, education system actually pulls the youth away from the, um, the rural sector. So one of the critical things that we need to rethink is how to make uh, agriculture or rural sector more, more attractive. And um, I, I think now it has become critical, given that 50% uh, of, uh, of the population is, I um, think, younger than 25 years of age. And, and we also know that the, um, most of the people who are engaged in, uh, in agriculture are really the, the older generation. So providing um, structures and incentives which attract the, the youth is, is very important. And um, I, I think now the whole concept of um, rural employment and um, supporting entrepreneurship for, for the youth, which is based on, on agriculture and no farm employment is, uh, is important. I, I know, for instance, in, um, in Ethiopia, the, the strategy uh, includes um, providing facilities, linking them to agribusiness facilities so that they can engage in, um, in business as a farming. Uh, in areas like beekeeping, small ruminants, engaging in dairy. And, but also going beyond and supporting them to be engaged in value addition uh, so that they can do like, you know, milk processing, making uh, honey, and, and, and the other aspects of the, um, other aspects of the value chain. Producing pro finance products and credit that would uh, allow them to participate in uh, inclusiveness, which was mentioned. So looking, or looking at products and services especially in financing and credit, which would facilitate them to be engaged in, uh, in, in different aspects of the, um, of, of, of the value chains, um, in this case, livestock value chains. But I think one of the other areas where most people don't think very much about is in agribusiness development services. Uh, you know, you engage them in uh, feed production, engage them in transportation of agricultural commodities, assist them so that they can get engaged even in prefabrication uh, of, of equipment and machinery which, is, which can then be utilized by, by other, other farmers. And, and I think finally, um, you can even link them in to the, even the the more commercial or large-scale farms, again, by thinking of the kind of uh, institutional strengthening and capacity development that you can, you can, you can put in place. I think the main thing is uh, provide incentives and infrastructure, which has been, as has been said, makes farming a business mm -hmm. and, and, and makes related off-farm enterprises are attractive. You, if you go into Addis, you will see a lot of young people who actually are just there, but they can be encouraged to stay in the rural areas. And, and, and you know, um, once you create demand, you create flows, economic flows, you create more employment, and this is how economic growth is, is achieved. So I think that we need to rethink again in terms of um, development from youth perspective as well, and women, of course. Thank you. Well, join me in thanking the panelists. I think they have done a great job. And, uh, thank you.